A good day and thank you for joining CivilNet. Today my guest is Dr. Herat Chilingirian. He's a scholar and a lecturer at the Oriental Institute of the University of Oxford, specializing in Eastern Christianity and Armenian studies. Uh, thank you for being here. I know your visit in Armenia is very compact and you've already visited Ghalabagh. You've had lectures at the American University at Madanatala and also State University and some lectures. So thank you for finding time to come here and have this conversation with, with us. So uh, you specialized in things that your, your studies uh, go in subjects that are constantly changing now, especially. Yes. Middle East, inter-ethnic conflict, Turkish-Armenian relations, diaspora, everything is changing its definition. As much as I'd like to discuss all of this, let's let's concentrate yes. about the, yeah. <laughs> the diaspora. Although they're interrelated in a way, I, I, I suppose. So the diaspora ha has changed more so in the recent year, or hasn't it? As something that's not been defined completely, does it now need rede redefinition? I think we should start uh, when we talk about the diaspora, especially in recent uh, months and years. We are always speaking about the diaspora, Armenia, Armenia uh, diaspora relations. I always make uh, the, uh, the introduction that, first of all, the diaspora is not a country that we can compare with Armenia. The diaspora is primarily a collection of communities. So the collect that collectivity is called diaspora. So it's a description of a state of being rather than uh, a state or uh, a unified uh, unit or uh, group of people. So this is very important to keep in mind. So as such, the diaspora, we have to talk about the diasporas rather than one uh, entity. This is very important. Secondly, I think we have to be very practical when we talk about the diaspora. We're not talking about or we shouldn't talk about the six or seven or eight million Armenians. I don't think uh, we could talk about that, but the diaspora, in my view, is primarily uh, seven organizations. The three churches, the three political parties, and the AGBU. In a very practical uh, approach. So, uh, because the rest of the uh, structure is under these seven organizations, give and take. Of course, there are uh, academic institutions, Armenian chairs, or there are other organizations outside uh, the orbit, so to speak, of these seven organizations. But uh, the traditional uh, structures of the diaspora are uh, seven organizations. So in a way, uh, in a very practical way, if when you think about it, uh, what would the first step be to uh, talk about the diaspora's uh, position is to bring these seven leaders, the, the leaders of these seven organizations, put them in a room and say, let's decide what our position should be vis-a-vis -vis Armenia, or what, what are our priorities on a national level, uh, both in the diaspora and Ar so on and so forth. Of course, this might sound very naive and very simplistic because uh, I'm sure Others have thought about this. I'm not saying anything new or unique. Uh, uh, I'm sure there are reasons why our organizations or leaders have not come together. But those leaders and seven you know, groups, let's say, they're, we're not talking about you know, uh, communities from Lebanon. Or we're talking about organization, political party, and church. So they've already. Uh, confess allegiance to one side or the other, they've already decided for themselves. So such a dialogue for the sake of the diaspora construction or structuralization, is it possible actually? Uh, well, is it I a dialogue that can happen anytime soon or in a constructive manner without the crumbling of one or the other or institution? I think in a way there is obviously some dialogue, some cooperation, maybe not as satisfactorily as or as expected. Uh, so there are, I mean, I'm, I'm talking in a more simplistic or simple way, but of course it's much more complicated than you know, reducing to seven. I think there is some uh, cooperation, dialogue, discussion among these seven organizations. 
But also what we are seeing recently is that we have other groups, other interest groups, whether through the social networks or uh, other organizations, as if uh, prompting, forcing, kind of uh, bringing it open to the public, whether through campaigns or through letters, uh, prompting these leaders to, uh, to move. So uh, we, uh, we often complain about the, the you know, lack of democracy as such in Armenia, in a more classical and accurate sense of the word. Can we complain of the same in the diaspora, whereas the individual uh, or a smaller group of individuals or like-minded people or somehow more radical people are never heard, taken into consideration, and however constructive their ideas or their approach might be, it's usually uh, aborted halfway because it never reaches uh, any of the seven. Well, I mean, uh, we have issues of transparency, and I mean, there is some democracy, at least uh, most organizations, they have elected executives, even though the numbers are small, but they, uh, pretend or they claim to. But in my, in my experience, at least from Lebanon, I would say such organizations are self-producing. Yes, uh, self-sustaining. Yeah, self-sustaining, yes. self-producing members. It's all, oftentimes hereditary. Uh, so integration of a fresher sector of the society, diaspora, or groups of people yeah. into this leadership seven. It sounds like we're talking about Game of Thrones, the seven. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that something that's possible or will be possible? I think uh, just as a footnote, m we could talk about eight. If you, if you say Antilias Ichmiadzin, then it would be eight. But I'm counting one of the churches as one. So uh, I think what we are seeing now uh, at this juncture in uh, our perhaps uh, history, where the traditional Armenian community organizations of the diaspora and the new thinking, the, the professionals, the academics, the people who have much uh, bigger vision or expectation from our uh, communities, uh, they're trying to open the, uh, the space, so to speak, a much uh, to make it much larger, uh, much uh, inclusive to include uh, ideas or opinions that are not necessarily uh, shared by the traditional organizations. But is it being more inclusive, or are these organizations, uh, people, individuals, let's say, coming forward with their own initiatives? Because what we see lately with open letters and announcements and petitions, uh, it's it's usually groups that feel marginalized by the seven <laughs> or eight slash eight who are coming forward and are already showing resistance. And I will also tell, um, to be honest, from my experience in Lebanon, I felt quite claustrophobic there as an individual, yeah. not belonging to any of the, uh, of the group, leadership groups. Uh, I, I felt quite helpless and- uh, Especially well, women. Claustrophobic in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, so are they really being inclusive or are individuals being more outspoken or have more tools at their disposal? I think when I say inclusive, I think uh, at least uh, some of the uh, people that I've spoken in the traditional Armenian mean, organizations, they realize that they don't have any other choice, that it's time to open up, to uh, listen to the new generation, the more professions, even some uh, political parties, they have internal uh, disagreements, which we might not uh, read in the papers, but uh, we are, I'm sure we know anecdotally that there is an internal uh, dynamic going, uh, disagreements or uh, views, I think differences of uh, views and so on. So there is that uh, process going, but also I think uh, I believe in order to be more effective in these uh, efforts, whether it's uh, for political uh, transformation and so on, so we have to be more uh, concrete, more specific. Uh, I mean, if we say, uh, if we are making a big announcement to the diaspora, who is the diaspora? No one in the diaspora takes that as addressed to him or herself. 
But if we, if we are more specific to, let's say, if we need uh, assistance or contribution in the education sector, we have to go and ask people uh, who are uh, the experts, who are in the universities, who have the expertise, and ask you know, specific individuals or group of people who uh, would take that as a, as a personal invitation uh, to help a specific thing. A lot of times people psychologically, when they are asked to do something and they don't feel capable or have the enough resources to help, uh, they, uh, they withdraw from the scene because they feel inadequate uh, to contribute. And sometimes our national problems are so huge, whether financial contributions, whatever, that people uh, find it more secure uh, to withdraw and uh, have their own. Come to their own on their own, yeah. probably. But if, if we uh, address people or uh, ask people for specific talent and resource and knowledge and whatever that may be, address it, they will feel more uh, comfortable that, yes, I can do this. Dr. Chinigay, yeah, one more question. Dias this misdefined diaspora's need to restructure itself and its need to impact Armenia positively, positively. Are these processes that, in your opinion, can parallelly exist? You mean our uh, like developments? As, we spe our, as we're speaking, diaspora's need to impact Armenia civil society is now greater than ever before. I'm not talking about benefaction. And also diaspora's need to define and re reinforce or restructure itself is also greater today than it has ever been, if I'm, yeah. uh, if I'm reading this right or if, the, uh, if I'm understanding this right. So these two processes, can they parallelly coexist and be uh, f fertile? Yeah, I mean, my final and perhaps uh, controversial uh, uh, answer to yours would be that what I said in the beginning that let's not think of the diaspora of the 8 million people, Armenians living in 100 countries, but the diaspora, the type of people that you're talking about is perhaps a few thousand people. Let's say three to five thousand people who can actually uh, make a difference. So uh, the challenge is uh, to mobilize that segment, those who are uh, aware of the situation, those who are uh, connected uh, emotionally, intellectually, and, and with feelings. And are so they? On. With yes, there are. Yes, I would say, but. Again, uh, my caution is that it's a limited number, let's say 5,000 people in the diaspora who would actually make a difference. So rather than, what I'm saying is rather than say, uh, dear diaspora, which nobody takes it as a personal yes. uh, or identifies with that, we have to be more specific that uh, dear academic, uh, dear activist, dear bank, uh, president, and so on and so forth. Uh, we need help in these areas. Please, here is an opportunity to contribute to Armenia's uh, development. Yes. Thank you very much. And that kind of seems to be the tendency now. A lot of people are sa uh, saying the same thing in different formats, as like the individual is now uh, the change maker rather than the organization that, that can bring in a lot of uh, positive change to yeah. Armenia. Thank you very much for your time and for it's the pleasure. conversation. And we also thank the viewers for joining us. Stay well, CivilNet, for more conversations and news. Mm -hmm.